Ancient Greece had some strange traditions. You had people making pilgrimages to mountains to women high on volcano fumes so they can know their future. There were drinking games where people threw wine around rooms, women who dressed up as men for their weddings, and theaters of people wearing masks who get beaten with canes if they didn't behave. The culture that gave us Aristotle and democracy could get a bit rowdy. Here are some of the weirdest traditions in ancient Greece. Oracle at Delphi In 336 BC, Alexander the Great traveled to a remote temple perched on the slopes of Mount Parnassus to consult the Oracle of Apollo at Delphi. He had ambitions of conquering the world, and he wanted them validated. When he met the high priestess called the Pythia, he was quite disappointed. She refused to give him any kind of an answer about whether or not he'd be king of the world or whatever title he had in mind, and instead told him to come back later. She was busy. Furious, Alexander dragged her out of the temple by her hair until she yelled, You are invincible, my son! And then he let her go. Alexander the Great may have been, let's say, impatient. But he wasn't the only one who traveled from Athens to have his fate told. Everyone came to the Oracle at Delphi to see what the high priestess had to say. From King Leonidas of Sparta to Socrates, all the great movers and shakers of ancient Greece wanted their fortunes told. The Oracle's prophecies affected political alliances and military campaigns. They helped decide where colonies would be founded. In a lot of ways, this temple and the shadowy priestesses inside it helped shape the course of Greek history. Also, they were getting high all the time. Deep within the inner sanctum of the temple, there were natural gas chambers and a perpetual fire lit that had been burning for centuries. When weary travelers seeking guidance or advice arrived at the temple, they would ask the Pythia their question. One question is all they were allowed. She would then go back into the inner sanctum and sit on the tripod of Apollo. That's a three-legged stool placed over a crack in the rock where gas leaked out. The vapors gave her hallucinations and supposedly induced a trance-like state. She'd have her vision, go back out, and give the travelers their answer. How much do you think a Pythia charged for that? The fact that so much of Greek history was influenced by a woman in a cave inhaling gas fumes is pretty amazing. What we don't know is if she also baked cookies for her guests, like the Oracle in the Matrix. Nah, she was probably too high. Catabo's Drinking Game Who doesn't like a good drinking game? Which ones are your favorite? For the Greeks, drinking and philosophizing often went hand in hand. The Greek Symposium was a tradition where upperclassmen got together and talked about the nature of the universe while getting smashed and throwing wine around the room. There's a good reason university frat houses use Greek letters, I guess. The symposiums, or symposia, I guess would be more grammatically accurate, were usually hosted in someone's home. They would gather in a room called the Andron, kind of like an ancient Greek man cave, reclining on couches set up in a U-shape with their left arms resting on pillows. This freed up their right arms to do things like eating and drinking and playing games. Wine played a starring role in the symposium. It was usually diluted with water and served in special wine vessels called craters, which were like big mixing bowls that would be stirred by a slave and then drunk in a cup called a kylix. As guests got looser and looser, they would have deep discussions ranging from poetry and literature to politics and philosophy. But it's not a party without a bit of fun. There'd be music, dancing, and at some point after enough wine had been quaffed, they'd start throwing it around the room. Catabos, as the game was called, was one of the most popular games of the symposia. Like any good drinking game, the rules were pretty simple. Once you'd finished your glass of wine, you flicked the dregs left over on the bottom of the kylix at a target that was placed in the center of the room. The Greeks had special kylix cups just for this occasion. They had long stems and wide, shallow bowls that made flicking the wine dregs easier. The target was often some kind of image or object that was either hung from the ceiling or floating in a basin of water. Sometimes the game involved trying to knock down a specific part of the target. Whoever was the most accurate won. Won what though? A prize? Did these wealthy Greeks win a new servant? Or get to decide which play would be put on at the local amphitheater? No, there weren't really any prizes involved. What they did get from it was probably a hangover the next day though. Spartan Marriage Elaborate gowns and floral arrangements, and caterers, DJs, event planners, photographers, RSVP letters, Western weddings are a whole expensive extravaganza. 
But in Sparta, things went a bit differently. It was a lot simpler, but also a lot weirder. But hey, the Spartans probably thought that a four-tiered wedding cake and people walking down an aisle was pretty weird too. Spartan weddings went like this. Spartan brides would wake up, yawn, and start their wedding day by shaving their heads. It was an act that symbolized their transition from single life to married life. Was her hair impure? Most likely it was a look that symbolized a simplicity and no-nonsense mindset that Spartans valued at the time. After shaving their heads, the brides would put on men's clothing and sandals. She would then go to her room at her parents' home, turn off the lights, lie down in the dark on a pallet or bed, and wait. Wait for what? Wait for the groom, who would sneak in and consummate the marriage, and then he'd leave. Other sources say the groom would steal her. They'd go consummate the marriage at his place and then return her home. How are you sneaking and stealing when everyone knows what you're going to do? I'm just asking. This would go on for days, months, and sometimes years. The bride and groom were not allowed to see each other in the daytime until the bride became pregnant and the marriage was official. There were a few reasons why Spartan weddings went down like this. Sparta was more of a bare-bones militaristic society that valued discipline and austerity. There were no dowries involved in their weddings either. Dowries were gifts and money that usually the bride's family pays to the groom's family. The Spartans also didn't bring religion into marriage ceremonies at all. In other Greek city-states, religious rituals and ceremonies were performed to invoke the blessings of the gods. But the Spartans, eh, you know what, they were not interested in any of that. Until they got married, the men would usually stay in military barracks. It was from these barracks that they'd steal over to the bride's family home and have their time together. It seems that the Spartans preferred to spend their money on military equipment rather than elaborate expensive weddings. Theater Days Theater in ancient Greece was so important that it was considered a civic duty for Athenian citizens to attend. The city would even subsidize tickets for people who couldn't afford them so everyone could go see a comedy or a tragedy. The Greeks saw theater as a way to educate the masses, to teach them about politics and morals. The stories they told and the structures with which they told them would lay the groundwork for literature and film and Marvel action movies we know and love today. Ancient Greeks would head over to the amphitheater during the day. These amphitheaters were some of the coolest things the Greeks built. They were carved into the sides of hills, built in a semicircle, an angle in a way that produced a natural megaphone effect so the actors could be heard even by the commoners sitting in the nosebleed sections. At the start of the play, a chorus of between 15 and 25 people would come onto the stage dressed in all kinds of elaborate costumes. They introduced the story, set the mood, gave background information to the audience. They explained who the characters were and what happened in the lead up to the events depicted in the play. They sang and danced and chanted things called choral odes, which often reflected on the drama or comedy that was unfolding in the play and gave some kind of moral or philosophical commentary. The Greeks loved their moral and philosophical commentary. Then the actors came out. The actors in ancient Greek theater wore masks that took all kinds of strange forms. If the play was a comedy, they'd wear some freaky laughing masks. If it was a tragedy, their mask might look like the face of someone getting stabbed in the stomach. And as we've seen from the Katabo's drinking game, the Greeks loved a good competition. It was no different with theater. Each spring in Athens, there was the Dionysia Festival. It was dedicated to Dionysus, the god of wine and fittingly fertility. You know, sometimes the two go hand in hand if you know what I'm talking about. One of the central events of the festival was the theater competition. A panel of judges who were basically picked out of a hat by the common folk would judge the plays that were put on. Wreaths of ivy were given to the best playwrights, directors, actors, and set producers. It was the Oscars, but it was in real time. And like the Oscars, it was a big deal to win. All the most celebrated playwrights competed. Sophocles, Euripides, Aeschylus, and Aristophanes. Keep an eye on Aristophanes. This was a whole process for these guys to get their plays made. They had to write them, obviously. Then they had to submit them to the Athenian public official, who chose a few of the best and handed out the money to put them into production. The playwrights then had to write all the music and do the choreography for the dancers who performed during the play. For these grand theatrical flourishes, playwrights got extra money from sorgos. Sorgos were wealthy arts patrons. Usually one sorgo would be appointed by the state to finance things like the set design, costumes, and rehearsal space. They even paid the actors and chorus performers. Side note, there's a pretty good legend about the playwright Aeschylus. He's written some of the most famous tragedies in history. But his end was apparently even more tragic. It's said that an eagle carrying a tortoise in its talons mistook Aeschylus's bald head for a rock. The eagle dropped the tortoise, which then bonked him on the head and killed him. 
That story would have most likely have been turned into a comedy by one of history's first satirists, Aristophanes. Aristophanes liked to mock politicians and important officials, so much so that a lot of them wanted to fight him. One of Aristophanes' most famous targets was a guy named Cleon. Cleon was a prominent Athenian politician who was apparently a bit of a rabble-rouser and a demagogue. In his comedy The Knights, Aristophanes depicts Cleon as a greedy and corrupt sausage seller. Not a good look. The play made Cleon super angry, and he ended up suing Aristophanes for slander. But instead of saying sorry, Aristophanes made another play called The Wasp, which was clearly about Cleon's love of suing people. The main character's name is Paphlagon, which comes from the name of a type of unappetizing-looking boiled ham. Also, not a good look. The Thesmophoria Ancient Greece was a very liberal place if you were a man. Women, on the other hand, sadly were not considered citizens. Women also couldn't be actors. Any female character in a play was played by a man, but at least they had their own festival where they could blow off some steam. The Thesmophoria was a three-day festival that could only be attended by married women who had gone through certain initiation rituals. The central theme of the festival was the myth of Persephone's abduction by Hades and how Persephone's mom, Demeter, then mourned about her daughter's disappearance. During the festival, women would fast and perform different rituals that revolved around the story. They'd place sacred objects and offerings in underground chambers to symbolize Persephone's descent into the underworld. They would also sacrifice a whole bunch of baby pigs and then bury them underground. The goddess Demeter was associated with fertility and agriculture, and apparently the pigs helped make sure Demeter was happy and the harvests were good. And they sat around and told dirty jokes. One of the days included something called ritual obscenity. Telling raunchy jokes was apparently one of Demeter's favorite pastimes. So I have for your viewing and listening pleasure some jokes that maybe could have been told back then. Imagine a group of women lounging around swapping jokes kind of like the men did with a symposium where they lounged around and threw wine at targets. Why did Zeus complain about his wife Hera's cooking? Because she always turned his favorite dish into a thunderous argument. Oh man, I am smoking. Okay, here's another one. Wait, 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 wait. Why did the young bridegroom say he was the strongest man in the world? Because he claimed he could carry his wife's endless demands without breaking a sweat. Woo, man, I am ready to go on tour. Don't go too crazy in the comment section. I'm a sensitive man. Food Taboos The ancient Greeks loved a good feast and festival. And while they quaffed wine and stuffed their faces with grapes, there was some food and drink they just wouldn't touch. Drinking milk was a pretty big no-no particularly among adults. The Greeks associated it with barbarians and saw it as fine for babies, but not for adults. Then there was meat from domesticated animals like cows and sheep. This meat was fine for religious offerings to gods, but people eating the stuff on a daily basis? Only peasants would stoop to such levels. If they did eat the meat from domesticated animals, it was usually during a festival or ceremony where part of it was offered up to the gods. First though, it had to go through a purification process. There were all kinds of rituals associated with eating meat. The animal chosen for sacrifice was selected based on its age and health. I mean, you didn't want a sick cow to offer up to the gods. Then the animal was brought to an altar, where an official would say some prayers to whatever god they were worshipping that day. The animal was then, well, slain, usually with a swift, precise cut to the throat. Its blood was often collected and sprinkled over the altar. The animal's organs, and the liver in particular, were then scrutinized for signs of omens that could indicate whether the god approved or disapproved of the sacrifice they offered up. After the purification and sacrifice were completed, the meat could then be distributed among the participants and worshippers. If all this sounds gruesome to you, then you'd be in good company with a bunch of other ancient Greeks, Pythagoras in particular. The guy who gave us A squared plus B squared equals C squared was a strict vegetarian. But for stranger reasons, many people refrain from eating meat today. Pythagoras and his followers believed in the transmigration of souls, a concept where the soul passes from one body to another when we die, and it could be anybody. So for example, if you came back as a pig, there's a good chance you might be sacrificed up to Demeter during the women-only Thesmophoria festival we talked about earlier. Pythagoras saw animals as sentient beings with souls, much like humans. Taking the life of an animal for food was the same as taking a human life. Pythagoras founded a whole philosophical and religious movement called Pythagoreanism. His dietary principles were a big part of the philosophy, which emphasized values like self-discipline and moderation. Oh, yeah, and he hated beans. Beans were thought to contain the souls of the dead and were difficult to digest because of this. 
So I don't know how he got his protein. How do you think he got his protein? Cain and Abel. There's a story that the audience of Aristophanes' play The Night laughed so hard that it disrupted the actors and chorus on the stage. But you know, sometimes things could get even rowdier. Greek theater goers weren't opposed to booing and hissing at a play they didn't like, or even pelting the stage with vegetables, stones, or whatever else they brought with them. Another side note, who brings vegetables to a play? I mean, were these people making salads in the amphitheater? You know, there's no eating in the amphitheater. There's a story about another of Aristophanes' plays where this kind of thing happened during the performance. The Clouds was a satire that made fun of Socrates and criticized the Greek education system, which Aristophanes thought was too full of abstract ideas and people gazing up at the clouds and analyzing the heck out of them. The clouds themselves were personified as deities that people worshipped in the play, which was apparently a commentary on how abstract ideas and philosophies were often elevated to the level of gods among the Greek intelligentsia. Anyway, the main joke is that Socrates runs a school called The Thinkery, where the main character enrolls so he can learn how to persuade people to forgive all the debts he owes him. The play is full of all kinds of convoluted debates and absurd logic to show how, in Aristophanes' opinion, philosophers like Socrates tended to overthink things. Now, I don't know if you know this, but Socrates was a pretty big deal in ancient Greece, and a lot of people liked him. When the play was performed during the Dionysia festival in 423 BC, the crowd wasn't pleased with how Socrates was basically portrayed as the intellectual equivalent of a snake oil salesman, and they started booing and hissing and throwing stuff at the actors in chorus. Maybe one of those throwing lettuce was Socrates himself. The famed philosopher was in his 50s at the time, and he lived nearby. The play itself won third place in the festival. That's third place out of three. But to make sure things didn't get too out of hand, the Greeks had people call staff bearers who were holding intimidating-looking sticks to make sure no one misbehaved. They were like a combination of a bouncer and an usher. They were a, a bouncer. One of the key rules in ancient Greek theaters, and in theaters today, was that the audience stay silent during the performance. The guys with the sticks, they would patrol the aisles and make sure things didn't descend to the level they did at the Aristophanes play. They also helped guide people to their seats, and they had a useful staff to point at things with. Hey, thanks for watching. What other strange traditions would you like to learn about? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more Nutty History.